maybe we should get started because we have one hour uh, reservation here. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the uh, this side, effect, uh, side event of uh, the uh, International Religious Freedom Summit. And today we have a panel. It's called Falun Gong, False, uh, False Organ Harvesting and the Global Impact. And we have excellent panelists today. And my name is Arping Zhang. I'm the spokesperson for Falun Dafa Information Center. And I'll be the moderator today. If I'm not doing a good job, blame on the jet lag. I'm from New Jersey, so, you know. <laughs> um, anyway, we're going to have uh, uh, Levi Brody uh, start. And uh, Levi, is, uh, um, Levi Brody is the executive director of the Falun Dafa Information Center. Uh, despite his youthful appearance, he has a, a, a quite a storied life. Uh, he was a, a career soft, uh, software entrepreneur, and now he's retired, I think. Uh, he started Falun Gong practice um, just soon after the persecution started in 1999. And he has been quoted by New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and CNN, and the AP, BBC and spoke at the uh, U.S. Capitol Hill and also Human Rights Commission in Geneva, uh, Switzerland. But not the least, he was arrested on Tiananmen Square. And we are very curious what happened. Levi, you want to start? Okay, thank you. Um, quickly, I just want to give some of the basics. Can you hear me? Good? Okay. Um, let me cover some basics. I think Falun Gong is a topic that people don't necessarily hear a lot about. We all have a general understanding of Christians and Muslims and, and, and Buddhists and so forth. But what is Falun Gong? Um, so briefly, as a background, Falun Gong is a Buddhist-based meditation practice uh, that involves slow-motion exercises, a sitting meditation, and studying of Buddhist principles centered around truthfulness, compassion, forbearance. Um, its lineage goes at back millennia, but it was first made public in China in 1992. And in seven or eight short years, um, according to the Chinese government survey, 70 to 100 million people had taken up the practice, which is an enormous amount of people even in China, uh, one out of every 13 people in the country. Um, it was widely popular there. It was in, in, endorsed by the government in the 90s. And then at the end of the 90s, 1999, the Chinese Communist leader, Chen Zemin, decided because of the size and its traditional uh, values um, to persecute Falun Gong. And for the last 22 years, anybody who practices or advocates for Falun Gong inside China is at risk of arbitrary detention, imprisonment, torture, or even, or even being killed. Um, and that's the situation that we're looking at now and what has been going on for the last 22 years. Um, so a couple things. I just wanted to, what I'll cover today is just some updates on what's happening more recently inside China. Um, and I want to talk first about a woman named Chuna, because um, her story is very illustrative. Uh, Chuna and her husband, um, uh, they're both artists. They live in Beijing. In, starting in 2001, they were both persecuted and incarcerated. She spent several years in prison, was tortured horrifically. She finally got out. And then in the Olympic roundup that happened in 2008, she was detained again along with her husband. After a few days, her husband was dead in uh, police custody, and she spent the next several years again incarcerated. She was released. Just last July, we got word that she has been uh, detained again along with many, many other friends. Um, not necessarily this time because of her practice of Falun Gong, but because she was revealing the reality of what was happening with the pandemic inside Beijing. And so this is the third time that she's been picked up. So here we have a young woman. Her husband is dead from torture. Um, her friends are scattered to the wind, some in prison. Some are living a life of destitute because they can't go home because the police are, are chasing them around. This is the state of Falun Gong inside China today. Her case is very illustrative. There are tens of thousands of these cases all around the country. Um, which brings me to the first point of update, and that is... Over the last 18 months, the persecution of Falun Gong in China has escalated significantly. Um, anywhere between 20, we get 10, between 10 and 20,000 cases a year of different types of persecution, incarceration, abduction, imprisonment, uh, ransacking of homes, this kind of thing. Um, and it went up uh, significantly over this last 18 months. Why? There were three reasons. The first was 
Falun Gong is targeted these days inside China not just because of their practice, although that is a major part of it, but because they have developed a network of information sharing inside China that is unprecedented in scale. Millions of people are involved in reporting on the crimes inside China and getting it outside of China, both about the persecution of China, but just, just in general of things that the CCP is doing. And, of course, in the case of Shuna, you saw this. She was uh, reporting on the pandemic. So that's one reason that when we saw the pandemic and people should have been in lockdown in large parts of China, you actually saw a significant increase in the amount of practitioners being detained and kidnapped. Um, the second reason is something called the Zero Out campaign. And that's something that started at the beginning of last year about... Um, and it's a new... It's sort of breathing life into the anti-Falun Gong campaign of the CCP. And they do this every few years, the CCP leadership. And the goal of this campaign is to, this is where it gets its name, to zero out all the practitioners in their local area, make sure there's no one practicing anymore. And unlike previous years where they rely heavily on abduction and imprisonment and sentencing, in the zero out campaign they're using a wider range of tactics. They break down your door in the middle of dinner, they ransack your home, they extort money, they put pressure on your business and family. They're doing those kind of things to try and pressure people to give up uh, their Falun Gong belief. The third reason the escalation has happened is because of the 100-year anniversary of the CCP. Um, as happens with a lot of sensitive dates, they go after Falun Gong and other targeted groups, and we saw that again uh, happening this year. Um, a couple other things to note about what's happening recently. Obviously, Hong Kong is a big concern. Um, for many years, as an example, for many years, Falun Gong operated informa information booths on the streets of Hong Kong so that when tourists come from mainland China, where they live under state-run media, have no idea what's going on, they can actually get real information from journalists and other NGOs about what's really happened to Falun Gong and what's happening inside their country. It's very valuable for these people. Those information booths have been violently attacked, destroyed. People who have manned them have been attacked. Um, Falun Gong practitioners who are either journalists or working to expose the crimes in Hong Kong have been attacked, sometimes with baseball bats, violently. And so what's happening in Hong Kong is of, is of grave concern to us. And I think the last point I'll make in terms of what's happening is a continuation of a pattern that we've seen for years, but again, it's escalating, and that is the transnational repression. The CCP, according to Freedom House, the CCP is by far and away the biggest aggressor when it comes to trans, transnational um, suppression. That is persecuting Chinese people, religious minorities, outside of China in their own countries. And they do this through their missions throughout the country. They do this through technology. And that has taken a big step forward so that Falun Gong people in New York or Sydney or Paris um, continue to be suffer at the hands of the local mission putting pressure on local businesses, politicians, or even engaging in outright thuggery um, and having a lot of our own people outside the country, including the U.S., being beaten up um, and things of that nature. So that, those are the main points that I wanted to cover just so we understand the state of the Falun Gong issue both inside China and around the world uh, today. Thank you, Okay. Levi, I have a couple of questions because... Uh, um, I remember when I started volunteer work for Falun Gong back in the 1990s. There were certain media coverage which were pretty good. I actually, one of the uh, journalists for Wall Street Journal got Pulitzer Prize for the coverage of Falun Gong persecution in China. But however, uh, recently we don't see uh, much of the co coverage. And more uh, surprisingly, uh, there were a couple of uh, uh, media coverage that was quite negative, echoing the uh, CCP, the Communist Party's uh, rhetoric against Falun Gong. So, the, you know, you are American here, growing up here, growing up here. Uh, can you tell me you know, why this is happening? That's a really great question, and it's a difficult one to answer, but I think I want to highlight one of the first things you said. Uh, in the first two years, right, the Wall Street Journal won a Pulitzer Prize, as you mentioned, for its coverage of Falun Gong. And even the Washington Post had, had turned out a couple of pieces that were groundbreaking in terms of uncovering the fact that Falun Gong were being tortured and killed widespread in China. And then it all disappeared. Why did that happen? Well, I think there's a couple things to look at. And first of all, it's not for lack of evidence. If you look at the NGOs and the government entities that are responsible for documenting human rights abuses, including the Department of State and the United Nations, including Freedom House, Amnesty, year after year, every single year, 
uh, cases of Falun Gong being persecuted, tortured, killed inside China are there. So the evidence is there. So it can't be that. So why the silence? I think the real, um, the real, the full answer is I don't know. What we could do is look at what we do know. And what we do know, and this is, this is the thing that has changed over the last 15 years, the ownership of most large media companies in the U.S. and in the West in general has significant business ties with China, whether it's the majority owner of the New York Times, Carlos Slim, the billionaire, or it's the corporate ownership of NBCs of the world. There's significant business ties, tens of millions of dollars, in some cases billions. So at the very least, this represents a significant and obvious conflict of interest to report accurately and fairly about Falun Gong in China when your ownership has such, a business, uh, has such business ties in China. I think there's also, we can't underestimate the amount of um, work, I guess you'd call it, that diplomatic missions have done here in the West. Um, there was a, a high-level diplomat that um, defected in Sydney, uh, Australia, uh, about 15 years ago, and one of the things he brought with him was a bunch of documents that showed that the CCP was actually using their missions to influence our politicians, our businesses, our communities to marginalize Falun Gong, to ignore Falun Gong, and they, they did it. In some cases, it was half of the effort of the entire mission, and so I think it would be hard to overstate how effective that has been in perhaps silencing Western institutions, including media, on, on covering Falun Gong. Thing. The other thing is, uh, I got a lot of questions uh, from people who are, who are curious about the persecution. And they always ask you, why the CCP persecuted Falun Gong? In what name? Or just, what kind of justification they have to, to uh, uh, persecute the group uh, so severely, you know, even amongst the, uh, the crime of uh, false organ harvesting? Yeah, the... The, the question of why they persecute Falun Gong is, a, is really a tragic one. Um, I think one was, was the, the, there's two factors. One was the numbers, that many people doing anything. A couple of the leaders of the Communist Party are going to get nervous, even if they're basket weaving. Um, 100 million people is a large amount of people. Then there was the ideology, the fact that Falun Gong was heartland China. It was sort of the very best of heartland China. And the CCB had just spent 70 years trying to stamp out traditional Chinese culture. And along comes Falun Gong. I think the, what really triggered it, though, was the top leader, Jen Zemin, at the time. He was the one who ordered the persecution. In fact, a lot of his lieutenants were against it at first. Um, he was the one that saw Falun Gong kind of stealing his thunder. He was the one who said, this decade needs to be about me, not about Falun Gong. Destroy them. And he's the one who really pushed it through. And that's what makes it sort of tragic. Now, the reasons they give, I think, maybe ties into your previous question, is if you look at why the CCP says they're persecuting Falun Gong, it's just straight up standard communist propaganda. I mean, it's lie after lie after lie. I'll give you a very concrete example, and this is, I, I still don't believe to this day they get away with this. If you look at the English language Chinese government websites, the first thing they say about why Falun Gong is so bad and they should be persecuted, and this is the English language, by the way, is that we're uh, racist or against racial integration, right? Uh, no, against racial, interracial marriage. I'm an interracial marriage. A lot of Falun Gong practitioners in my community are in interracial marriage. This is total nonsense. But they don't care. What they care about is, is this a hot-button issue, and will it resonate with people to convince them that Falun Gong is bad or evil or anything like that so that they'll turn a blind eye when they go and persecute Falun Gong? And they've been doing this in China for 22 years, and unfortunately they've been doing this through their diplomatic, diplomatic missions here in the West, and it has had an effect. When you go into a room and you're going to talk about Falun Gong, there is often something in the air, and that something are these lies that the CCP says about Falun Gong, which, again, are total nonsense if, you, you know, if you're just going to look at it. But they have repeated it so much that it has worked to some extent. And so when I go with, like, a victim to coming out of China to meet with a congressperson, um, and we're supposed to talk about the horrific torture this person has, has met with, we have to spend the first, you know, few minutes clearing up all this nonsense that the CCP has sent to this congressman's office, all these lies about Falun Gong, and sort of strip back and show them clearly none of this is true. But it hangs over the Falun Gong issue. I think Perry Link called it the, the anaconda and the chandelier. That's, that's what's going on, and that, that propaganda against Falun Gong has been devastating 
in trying to get people to stand up and advocate for Falun Gong equal to the degree of the crimes that are happening against it inside China. Uh, I, I, I wish to mention one thing. Uh, I, my first contact with Falun Gong actually happened in 1994. Uh, I was in Beijing, and uh, I was in the office in the uh, foreign ministry uh, in Beijing. And a group of people doing a, a meditation, and I thought they were sleeping because they had all their eyes closed. So I asked the bureau chief, I said, how could you guys get paid and sleep in the office? Uh, and they said, well, no, we are doing a meditation. Um, I said, what, what kind of meditation is that? They said, Buddhist meditation is called Falun Gong. So that's how my first contact with Falun Gong uh, in 1994. Uh, later, uh, this bureau chief told me that um, the New York Council General, uh, Chinese uh, Council General in New York, is going to host some seminars where you can learn Falun Gong because I was a student here in the United States. So I went to the uh, Falun Gong seminar uh, hosted by the Chinese Council General in New York. Uh, so there were a lot of overseas Chinese students and uh, some Americans because that was part of the, uh, uh, the soft power culture promotion for China. Back then, uh, we have Chinese medicine, Chinese cooking, uh, silk, and Falun Gong, and uh, among other things. So we, we went there, we, we learned the meditation, and they asked us to promote it to Americans. Uh, and we did. And in 1999, when the persecution started, um, so we went to the Chinese Consulate General in New York and said, you know, hey, you guys taught us the practice. And now why do you start persecuting the school? They said, well, you know, there's policy change in Beijing, so we couldn't do, handle this. So you guys just practice quietly here, and nobody's going to bother you. So that was the last word when we contacted the Chinese Consulate General. And Later on, they refused to uh, talk to us. Uh, so the students had back then, most of the Falun Gong practitioners back then are Chinese students in this country. So we organized protests, just similarly to uh, 10 years ago, uh, before the persecution of Falun Gong in 1999, in 1989, the Tiananmen Massacre took place. So the students organized a protest. Uh, so we organized uh, um, back then uh, to uh, you know, to the rallies and to send letters and emails calling the, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, the offices in China. And uh, later on, we found out, you know, we all been labeled as a cult, evil cult member. Um, but we still have images and, uh, of the uh, Chinese government proclamations and uh, certification awards for the health benefits and other things. Uh, for seven and eight years, the government was promoting it. In fact, the founder of Falun Gong, Li Hongzhi, was invited by through the Chinese embassy in, in, in France, in Paris, to give a talk in, in France, and also through the Chinese embassy in, in Stockholm, in Sweden, to give uh, lectures in uh, uh, Sweden. And all these facts can be found on the Internet, but no one is bothering to, uh, to, to bring this up. So it's kind of interesting to see that when the government found out you, once you have 100 million people, that's one out of 14. Every 14 people, there's one Falun Gong practitioner, practitioner because there's 1.4 uh, billion people population in China. So that's something that is, uh, I wish to uh, bring up. Uh, maybe we, we should go to the next speaker, uh, Mr. Wei Yu Wang. Um, He's a victim of the persecution. He is a software engineer, and um, he grew up in China. Uh, he was a PhD student uh, at Tsinghua University, which is equivalent of MIT here, uh, engineering school. Um, he uh, was uh, uh, detained a couple of times, and he was kicked out of the university for his uh, meditation practice. And, and then in the... Uh, uh, Later on, he was uh, sentenced to eight years, and then uh, afterwards, he uh, escaped uh, China in 2011, and uh, he managed to come to the United States in 2013, and now he and his family live in Michigan. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wei Wang. I was born in Shandong province, China, 1973. In 1996, I got my bachelor's degree and was recommended to pursue a doctorate 
at Tsinghua University. The next year, I started practicing Falun Gong. After I entered Tsinghua, I knew about the practice because Falun Gong meditation had been freely and openly practiced in all parks, communities, and schools for years. There were crowds of Falun Gong practitioners meditating peacefully in public spaces every single day. So in January 1997, during the first semester of my doctorate program, when I saw the book of Falun Gong, I immediately picked it up. The book's contents discuss the moral principles of truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance, an idea so attractive that I could not help but finish reading it in a few hours. I deeply realized that this is what I want. This is how people should live. To be a good person is determined by human nature inside. And to deviate from this principle is actually to betray one's own soul. And hundreds of people on campus welcomed me to realize this wish for spirituality. As far as I recall, there were 11 total groups of practitioners with more than 500 students and teachers meditating daily at Tsinghua. But ever since the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, led by Jiang Zemin, carried out the severe persecution of Falun Gong in mainland China from 1999, my family and I experienced oppression, experienced oppression and torture for 14 years. I was forced to suspend my schooling twice and give up my doctorate degree due to this wide-scale persecution. For nearly a decade, I was jailed and brutally tortured in prison by CCP authorities in Tianjin. I was sentenced at age 29 and lost in my 30s due to the crackdown on religion. Even after my release, I was closely monitored by police and CCP agents. In the fourth semester of 99, the CCP deputy secretary of my department at Tsinghua asked my classmates to condemn me one by one in, in a classroom for more than two hours. This was a familiar classroom filled with familiar faces, and I was suddenly brought to stand before dozens, dozens of them, defenseless and forced to listen. I still cannot forget the face of my close friend, who stood up and threatened me. If you keep your belief in Falun Gong, I will stab you to death. I was very astonished at that time. I had no idea that propaganda could change a person in such a dramatic way. In August 2002, after I was expelled from the university on the grounds of my spirituality, I was just walking down the street when I was suddenly thrown onto the ground by a group of strangers. They knocked my glasses off my face and then stepped on my head. This violence surprised the passersby, and some of them stopped and watched. The assailants told the pedestrians that I was a thief. I shouted back, I am a Falun Gong practitioner, not a thief. They were so scared at my words, they quickly covered my mouth and stopped me into a car. Then they drew me to a secret place that was especially made for detaining Falun Gong practitioners called the Legal Training Center. There, I was beaten and electric shocked endlessly from 6 p.m. to 5 a.m. the next day. The so-called trainers would shock my neck while grinning with electric batons continuously until the batons ran out of power. Then, they plugged electric batons directly into the sockets and continued to electrocute me. I was shocked all over my body, including all 10 fingertips, and they even pierced two electrodes into my back. The authorities would jump to smash my head with their elbows, called me a counter-revolutionist, and shot it with glee to scorch every, skin, every inch of skin. During the next six months, they locked me in solitary confinement and almost everything was forbidden, including talking, knowing the date or time, or even using the toilet. Going to the restroom required an application, but those requests were nearly all denied. Also, I was kidnapped in the summer with only the clothes on my body. So in the winter, 
I had to hug my legs tightly to resist the closest days of Beijing. The severe living conditions led to muscle atrophy. Every night, I fell asleep to the sharp sound of whiplashes and the horrible shrieks of women being tortured. During this period, my parents were not allowed to know my condition or my location, and these horrible days were not even regarded as a term of detention by the CCP government. Next, I was sent into Fengtai and Chaoyang detention center in Beijing. These centers kept Falun Gong practitioners on the edge of starvation. Even the jailers would say, "There's no human rights here." But the court judges would just shrug those complaints off and reply, "This judgment was not made by me, and I'm just following orders." In 2004, I was sent into Qianjin Prison, where jailers chose special criminals to monitor us 24/7. These criminals are usually felons, such as murderers, robbers, and drug traffickers, and the jailers offer them a reduced prison term. By harassing Falun Gong practitioners, if I even gave other practitioners a second glance, they would report it to the jailers. We were forced to labor outside, planting radishes, weeding, digging, or do factory work like wrapping candies, making paper muffin cups, or sports balls like volleyballs. While sewing those balls by hand, a practitioner pierced his eyeball with the iron. Crochet by accident, because we didn't have any protective equipment. Even now, I can't eat those candies and muffins because now I know they were made through forced labor. Prisoners are punished cruelly if they cannot complete their work on time, including sleep and food deprivation, electric shock, and severe beating. We are modern-day slaves. But even despite these horrid conditions, the CCP sat in front of us proudly. Who is capable of knowing what happens in Chinese prisons? If any international groups come, what they can see is a beautiful prison. What they can hear is only praise. Thus, when you hear any good words from the Uyghurs in Xinjiang labor camp or any prisoners in Chinese prisons, please be aware that. Those fake words are just reflecting the brutal behavior of CCP. Only dictators need such lies to cover their crimes. I cannot list all the brutal things I saw and experienced in China here today, but I want to make it clear that the Chinese Communist Party is not just persecuting Falun Gong practitioners or Chinese people. All the democratic countries, especially the United States. Have been on their agenda for many decades. Economic profit is just their lure. We have no other options but to wake up now. By the way, one of the wardens told me, "Tell your friends overseas, don't write letters to me again." And through the endless years of oppression under the party, I finally realized that they are afraid of something after all: voices of justice. So. Your voice really matters. Darkness is always afraid of being exposed to the light. Thank you. Ah,、uh, Wei Yu, let me quickly ask you one question. Ah,、uh, how are your parents? Are they under some sort of pressure? Y- yes. Yeah, they are leaders. You know, in China, there are a lot of、uh, leaders in Chinese.、Uh, Um, we, we call this office or Chinese uh, uh, in, industries. They, they just said, "Okay, if you still、um, help your children, you know, I will try try to fire you." So that is really a big pressure. And even the friends of my parents cannot say something to my、uh, parents. They just want to keep a distance with you know from my parents. That makes them feel very isolated. Yeah, that's pressure. Hi. Next, we're going to have、uh, Dr. Jessica Russo.、Uh, she is a practicing practicing psychologist、uh, in Philadelphia, and also、uh, affiliated with、uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, University uh, University Hospital. 
And she's also on the board of Doctors Against False Organ Harvesting uh, International NGO. So she's going to talk about the false organ harvesting. Jessica? For over three decades, the People's Republic of China has been accused of harvesting the organs of its own citizens by force. The victims are killed in the process, and their organs are used in transplant operations. This organ trafficking is a human rights abuse that affects all of us. But what is forced organ harvesting in China? How does it differ from transplant systems in other countries? And what evidence is there that it's taking place? Most countries have a voluntary donation system. Recipients wait for an organ to become available, sometimes for three or four years. When a donor dies, the best matched person on the waiting list is rushed to the hospital to receive their transplant. China has a very different system with reverse matching. Recipients pay for an organ to be made available. A prisoner who is the best match for the paying recipient is chosen from a large pool of detainees. The prisoner is then killed and their organs extracted for transplantation. Transplants for organs such as hearts, livers and kidneys are scheduled in advance and performed in a matter of weeks. It is not possible for an ethical organ donation system to provide transplants on demand. For years, there has been controversy over whether prisoners of conscience are being killed for organs. An independent people's tribunal, chaired by Sir Geoffrey Nice QC, was formed to assess all available evidence. After 12 months, including five days of public hearings, the China Tribunal concluded that forced organ harvesting has been committed for years throughout China on a significant scale. Falun Gong practitioners have been one and probably the main source of organ supply. And the vulnerability of the Uyghurs to being used as a bank of organs is also obvious. To understand how this atrocity began, we need to go back to the late 1970s when Chinese surgeons began transplanting organs from death row prisoners, a practice that was widely condemned. In 1994, Human Rights Watch reported three key findings. Political offenders and other nonviolent criminals were being used as sources for organs. Chinese doctors participated in pre-execution medical tests and matching of prisoners with recipients, often on a first-paid, first-served basis. And executions were deliberately mishandled to ensure that prisoners were not yet dead when their organs were removed. From 2000 onwards, China's transplant system rapidly expanded. At the same time, the authorities conducted a violent campaign to eradicate the Buddhist Qigong and meditation practice Falun Gong, which is practiced by millions in China. As the labor camps, black jails, and prisons filled with Falun Gong practitioners, so the volume of transplant operations dramatically increased. These rapidly available organs could not have come from death row prisoners alone. And, in comparison, Falun Gong practitioners are a healthier source for organs, as they do not drink or smoke, and do Qigong exercises regularly as part of their spiritual practice. The number of liver transplants in 2000 reached 10 times that of 1999. In 2005, the number tripled further. As the Chinese transplant system continued to grow, so did the pool of prisoners. In 2017, Muslim Uyghurs began to be incarcerated in vast numbers, with many reported missing. And although China recently began developing a voluntary donation system, there is still no transparency about the source of organs. From July 2018 to June 2019, members of the China Tribunal with expertise in international human rights law, organ transplantation, international relations, China studies and business reviewed multiple lines of evidence, including testimonies from relatives of deceased victims, fellow internees, and from Uyghur and Falun Gong detainees who were forced into blood tests and organ scans, including chest x-rays and ultrasounds. Some were overtly threatened with forced organ harvesting. Undercover phone call and video investigations from as recently as 2019 revealed admissions by government officials and surgeons that organs are available on demand and that Falun Gong organs are also available. 
In one forensically examined phone call, the former PLA Minister for Health, Bai Zhuzhong, stated that ex-President Jiang Zemin directly ordered the killing of Falun Gong practitioners for their organs. The China Tribunal also reviewed investigations compiling Chinese records, including bed utilization rates, surgical teams and hospital revenue that show 60 to 100,000 transplants have been performed each year, far more than officially claimed. In 2010, just one hospital carried out over 5,000 transplants. Other lines of evidence examined include official Communist Party documents of policy and practices, scientific studies in Chinese journals that detail suspicious data consistent with killing individuals for organs, and a statistical analysis of China's organ donation system showing that organ donation figures have been falsified and do not represent the real numbers. Based on these lines of evidence and proof of other acts, the China Tribunal not only found that forced organ harvesting has and continues to happen in China, it also found that Commission of Crimes Against Humanity against the Falun Gong and Uyghurs has been proved beyond reasonable doubt. But whose responsibility is it to act and what should be done? Medical institutions and companies must abide by their business and human rights obligations. This means cutting ties with China in relation to organ transplantation practice, research and training. States should enact laws combating international transplant tourism and Chinese perpetrators should be sanctioned. Governments around the world should take the necessary steps to seek justice and the Chinese Communist Party should be held accountable for its actions. As global citizens, it is our responsibility to speak out against forced organ harvesting. If we don't act now, many more lives will be lost. Dr. Ruslo, um, the film is really appalling. Um, why do you think, I mean, in 2006, the news broke out uh, because of a, a lady who came from China sharing news about her husband involved in the uh, removal of cornea and other uh, body parts. Uh, and then I remember Congressman Dana Robiker held a hearing right away uh, and then invited uh, some uh, professors of medicine to testify because some of them, they have their own patients uh, got the organs from China. However, there's still lack of media coverage of this uh, appalling uh, uh, crime. Uh, Congress has done quite a few hearings. The European Parliament has done quite a few hearings. In the end, both US Congress and European Parliament pass resolutions respectively. Yet we still don't get media coverage of this. Why is that? You know, it's, it's a great question, and it's, my answer would be very similar to Levi's answer. That, you know, our, our media, they have really been co-opted in many ways by the Chinese government. Because so many of them have ties to the CCP, they really can't touch this topic. It's very sad. And that's very true for our government as well. Uh, even down to the state, city level. All, all levels of government have been influenced by this. And I would say corporations, so many facets of our society have been influenced by the Chinese Communist Party. And, and this is really because of us, because of the United States. We've made them so powerful. We let them into the World Trade Center. We trusted them when we shouldn't, shouldn't have. Uh, you know, one of the stipulations for their entering the World Trade Center and staying in the World Trade Center was that they were going to respect human rights. And they never did this. And, and we dropped that requirement. So we've really been so gentle with them. And it's really taken a toll. We have become unwitting accomplices in this country. And I think this is true for many other countries as well. We have 
many transplant centers in this country who train, which train uh, physicians from China, transplant surgeons, who will likely go back and commit these murders. Um, because it is very true that the donation rate in China is next to nothing. Um, in 2018, it was reported at 0.03%. The execution rate is, is going down. It's a state secret. We don't know, know exactly how many there are that are uh, executed. Um, but certainly that is a very small number. The reports have indicated that there are between 60 to 100,000 transplants being done every year. And the primary group, all of the research is showing us, is it's Falun Gong practitioners. So it's a terrible thing that we haven't done more, but I think it's just simply because of all of these, these ties. And the CCP can make things very ugly for you. They're like the mafia, you know, if you don't do what they say. So... We, we just saw that, uh, you know, one of the reasons that the harvest organ from Falun Gong practitioner is because they're due, due to the health regime and, and because they don't smoke, they don't drink, so they have good organs. The other thing is, what are, what, what, what are the reactions worldwide? I, I read somewhere, you know, uh, in Taiwan, you are not allowed to go to uh, China to do. What kind of measures have the world taken largely? Yes, yeah, so there have been a few countries that have enacted laws, bills that we have in this country. Um, Taiwan, Italy, Spain, Belgium, Norway, and Israel was the first one. I think those are the countries. So it's, it's just a few countries. But this has been very effective. Israel uh, was the first to do this in 2005. A heart surgeon heard from his patient that he had an appointment to go to China in two weeks and get a heart. He thought he was joking. He wasn't joking, he went to China, he got his heart on the date promised. So he spoke with the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, and by 2008, they had enacted laws saying that if you are an Israeli citizen and you wanna to go to China to get a transplant, you have to use your own money for this. You're not gonna be reimbursed by the national healthcare system that completely cut out anybody going to China to get a transplant. It also raised the donation system in Israel, which had been very low. Um, but probably we are seeing similar things in other countries. That is something I would love us to do here. Um, we have Medicare that's a federal program, so I think that's, that's something that could be done with Medicare. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, next, we have Mr. Johnny Moore. Uh, he is an American religious leader and a businessman who founded the Carousel Company. And maybe he can explain what does Carousel mean. Uh, it's a PR firm. And he is actually recently in the news, I, I believe in May. Uh, all the mainstream media covered him. Uh, not, not necessarily he needs that because He's one of the uh, uh, most influential people, according to media reports, uh, in terms of uh, uh, influence on for religious cause, freedom cause. And he um, has been uh, uh, very active with uh, uh, international religious freedom cause. And uh, uh, maybe we should uh, uh, have him explain why he is uh, recently on China's blacklist. Um, usually we all know that, you know, a lot of Chinese officials, uh, they have a... Uh, their personal assets offshore in overseas and their family members living in luxury life in overseas in the United States as well. Uh, we're wondering whether Johnny, uh, <laughs> Mr. Moore, uh, owns privately the Bank of China. Maybe that's why they sanction you. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, now you are in the news. And uh, tell, tell us what, what happened. Well, if, I, if I'm a threat uh, to the Communist Party of China, they're in a lot of trouble. Uh, but but I, I, uh, I think I became the 51st person sanctioned by uh, the, the Communist Party in, in recent months. Uh, I was the latest of, uh, of a series of former Trump administration officials or Trump-affiliated officials. Uh, we, you know, we think the reason why they did this, aside from intimidation and all this stuff, which 
good luck intimidating Americans. But uh, aside from this, um, you know, they're trying to divide America on these issues. This is what they're trying to do. And so on the day of the inauguration of President Biden, uh, they sanctioned a whole series of, of, of Trump administration officials. Uh, it, it is, it is no, no coincidence they sanctioned a prominent evangelical. You know, I, I, I think uh, this, is, this is part of their attempt to divide American society. And what they found is the exact opposite. I mean, because American Democrats and Republicans, is, you, know, you clearly can see if you live in this country and, and, and if you watch CNN, you know, if you're abroad, they don't get along on much of anything. But what they've, what they've ended up doing, which, by the way, is our strength, the, the strength of our, our public square, we can argue back and forth and, uh, and, and, and come up to solutions together. But what they ended up doing is, uh, by, by sanctioning me and a lot of other people like me, they brought Democrats and Republicans together on the issue. And even while we're here now, uh, you know, the, the Biden administration plans on, uh, on additional actions, additional sanctions, uh, they have, uh, the, 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 the U.S. administration has blacklisted a number of companies that are about to take an action on Hong Kong. Uh, and, and so the, it, it was a terrible, terrible miscalculation. And, and, but this is a point of communism, okay? I, I, th- I think the Chinese Communist Party is way too overconfident. And, and, and one of the things that they recognize about, about the United States of America is we want to be their friends. We want to have a great relationship with China. But we also know how weak that they are. And, and uh, it is a sign of weakness uh, when, they, when they, take, they take an action like this. But, but far more than that, what we are seeing is we're seeing a relapse to the cultural revolution in, in, in China. It, it was not the tactics of the cultural revolution which made China uh, the, the second uh, most affluent economy in the world, one of the world's chief military powers. I might add... The gap between the United States and, 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 and China is immensely wide still. You know, being number two, you can be number two far away, uh, and they are. But what we're seeing, we're, we're seeing a relapse of the worst vices of the Cultural Revolution, and part of what that is are, are these tactics tar- targeting religious minorities. And, and Americans, don't, frankly, don't know the difference. I mean, Ameri- the average American, and they need to know, the average American doesn't recognize that they're probably about 100 million members of the party. Okay, there are more evangelical Christians in China than there are members of the Communist Party. When you, when you put the Tibetan community and the Falun Gong practitioners and the Uyghur Muslims and the various Christian communities, the, the, the China itself is by orders of magnitude larger than the Communist Party. And for the life of me, I don't understand why the Communist Party doesn't view its diversity in the country as its greatest asset. Instead, it's trying to wipe it all out, and we just can't stand for it. Well, they can't. They, you know, they can't control it because human beings are are are, are, are individuals. I, I'm a you know I'm a, a Christian. I believe everybody's made in, in the image of God. You can't turn uh, human beings into into robots. It's 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 not going to happen. Unfortunately, when it comes to the organ harvesting, what we're seeing is we're seeing what China, what, what this relapse to the cultural revolution is willing to do. Okay, uh, chief of which is COVID nineteen. The coronavirus, whatever the evidence ends up being, and whatever the discussions are, and, and the, in all likelihood, it will be universally acknowledged, at least with Republicans and Democrats in this country, that, that communist party mismanagement, whatever the, wherever the virus came from and all these things, if it was a lab leak or from a, the, the wet you know, the, the market or whatever, put that aside mismanagement by the Communist Party of China infected the entire world. And it was our democracies which believe in tolerance, which created the vaccines that have, that have healed the world. And, and the vision of... Uh, and, and I have to believe that there are people in the party who recognize that the prosperity... Uh, that that uh, that uh, that China is currently enjoying was not the product of the Cultural Revolution. That the Cultural Revolution killed 50 million people. It thrust countless millions of people in poverty. The prosperity that that that, that China is enjoying now was the product of reforms that tried to integrate free market principles into a into a communist framework. And and there have to be people sitting there saying like. 
how do we go back to a cult of personality? How do we go back to, uh, uh, to, to these uh, terrible practices trying to you know, d- destroy whole communities of millions of people, Uyghur Muslims and, you know, and, and Falun Gong? And every, how, do we, how do we do that and continue upon this path? It, the path the Communist Party is on is a dead end path, and it doesn't have to be this way. I should mention that uh, Ms. Morrow actually recently served as a commissioner of uh, international, U.S. Commission of International Religious Freedom. But I was so eager to mention that he was put on blacklist or the honor of maybe you also agree that the, the latter one is more significant. Uh, um, the, I think one, one of the things you mentioned is critical. What, regarding the U.S. Uh, post-China policy, the engagement policy. Um, in the past, it appears uh, the engagement policy has been uh, engaging with the Communist Party elite rather than the people. What do you think of that? You know, it, it's interesting to me. Like, I, don't, I don't fear the competition between the United States of America uh, and the Communist Party as it is now. I, I, I think when, it, when it's all said and done, um, when you try to control everything, you become overconfident, you make mistakes. That's what, that's what we're seeing. I tell you what I, what I fear from a competitive perspective is a free market China, is a, a China with democratic principles, one and a half billion people, what, whatever the government system is. You know, that, that, I, that is a competition between the United States and, 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 and between China. And I don't, I don't know whether the United States in the end would win that competition. With the brilliance of the Chinese people, one of the great civilizations in all, in, in all of history, Chinese innovation, Chinese technology. And so, so what's actually happening is an attempt to, to win the competition with the United States is actually putting a cap on the innovation in China and the progress in China and the economy in China. And, and frankly, I, I think... I, I, I think um, that, that what's happening is the party was backed into a corner because of, because of decisions that they made. And the current leadership is relapsing to the old practices. I mean, do we really, in China, do we have 19 senator, center, centers now dedicated to the thinking of the current leader? I mean, e- even, even, if I was, even if I was a communist, I would think that was a, an offense to Mao. Right? I mean, this is, this is not, this is not the, 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 the path forward. And I have to believe that there are even people in the party and, and among, um, um, among Chinese people everywhere. But the other thing is, like, it's just unbelievable. Like, how many people in the party vacation here? Right? They, they, they have property and interest here. Like, how many people want to enjoy the benefits of our, of our uh, democracy while, while trying to un- undermine it, you know, all, all, all around the world. And the democratic system is a system of government, okay? And, and you know, I, I, just as a Christian, I don't believe in theocracies. There are all kinds of different systems of government. I happen to believe democracy is the best one. Other systems of government, you know, have, but this system of government and the path that it's on, is a, it, it, is a, it is a dead-end path, and it's time for members of Congress that are meeting right now to take more drastic measures. And, and, uh, and rather than dividing the United States on the issue, because this is exactly what they attempted to do. They attempted to divide America along, along uh, 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 you know, to, to use our democracy against us. And what they've ended up doing is, you know, Donald Trump and Joe Biden don't agree on very many things. Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy and Chuck Schumer don't agree on very many things. By the day, they're agreeing more on, on standing up to, uh, to, to this. And everybody can be friends again tomorrow. The United States and, 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 and the Communist Party... But unfortunately, that, that doesn't look like the path that we're on. Many people are curious because right now uh, we see um, China's doing a, a $600 billion IPSAP each year. And the leaked document suggests that 1.8 million Communist Party members are working inside a Western corporations like IBM, Boeing, and foreign consulates. Um, we have Nike CEO who just recently said the Nike brand is off China and for China. So um, at the same time, uh, we have this uh, uh, gross human rights violations, religious persecution. What should the United States do to counter the infiltration and to counter such gross human rights violations? Well, 
Well, first of all, I mean, corporations can't have forced labor in their supply chains. I mean, the fact that we don't, we don't have a law that, you know, that uh, in fact, there are two laws right now, uh, uh, one in the House and one in the Senate, uh, to, to uh, stop, uh, you know, uh, in, any, uh, uh, any incentive towards to report on uh, forced organ, organ harvest. All this legislation needs to take place. But, but ultimately, I think the business community needs to watch what's happening in Hong Kong right now. I mean, because, because when, it's, when it's all said and done, um, we believed that, uh, that business would exclusively solve these problems. And you know what? Business is a great tool to solve problems. I, be, I believe it entirely. But there's a line. And, and uh, right now, aside from all the human rights abuses and everything else, people who sit on, you know, in, in, in high, you know, skyscrapers in New York City, they need to realize that the risk management equation for doing business with China has substantially changed you know, in, in the last year. And in fact, it's a substantially changed in the last two weeks. And shareholders and regular everyday Americans, the, the rules need to change. I, that's not to say that we exit the Chinese economy and all these, you know, you have, to, you, have to be smart, you have to be smart about these things. But it's time for American businesses and European businesses and others to do what they know is right, to put protections in place, to have the, you know, the, have the incentive structures in the right way. And if they don't do it, then the United States government uh, needs to make sure that they, uh, that they face consequences for it. Uh, and, and, and now is the time to do that. Well, thank you very much. Does anyone else have anything to add? I, I just wanted to say something about the... Um, Johnny Moore here. When he was first sanctioned, I wanted to point out the differences between the two sanctions. When he was first sanctioned by the Chinese Communist Party, it really brought friends together. In Johnny Moore, we have one of the significant religious freedom leaders in the world right now. He's doing great work in the Middle East. He's doing great work here. And now we were able to meet with him and talk with him and get his ideas. They've really brought us together. The sanctions that are going from the United States government to officials inside China that quickly spreads all over China, and Ch Chinese officials are now scared. They're hiding their tracks. They're trying, to, they're trying to cover up which department they work for so that they won't be caught up and possibly sanctioned themselves. And I think that's very reflective of the two systems of what's going on here. And um, if you see what happens with the sanctions in China and what happens with the sanctions here. And, and the, so, and, yeah. and, and it doesn't have to be this way. There are ways out of all of this. Uh, but, but unfortunately... Uh, the trajectory is not good for anyone. It's not good for our world. And imagine, I mean, just imagine. While we're here right now, someone is being killed so that their organs can be stolen from them to put into someone who has gotten on a plane and flown to China for an organ transport, uh, tra tra you know, transplant. Like, this can't happen. This simply, this, simply, this simply can't happen. And, and, our, and our corporations and our government, and again, if the, if the goal was to divide America, this has backfired. I have never seen a more divided time in American politics, and I have never seen a more bipartisan, bipartisan issue. And, uh, and we have lots of friends around the world that can play a role you know, in, 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 in all of this. But ultimately, I love China, you know, unlike, uh, unlike a lot of people. Um, uh, some some people have. I've been to China. I, don't know, I love China. I, I remember walking out in my you know in, in a hotel and seeing the Falun Gong uh, practitioner. Say, I love that country. And you know what? Yeah, the, I'm sad that I won't be able to to, to sit down with uh, with wonderful Chinese people uh, in in China uh, for for it's a terrible it's a terrible 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 thing. I'm sad. I'm not intimidated. And it doesn't have to be this way. And, and I, I think um, the, 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 the Chinese people uh, themselves uh, need to be very, very clear uh, with their government what their expectations are. And the United States government, governments all around the world need to get some backbone and incentivize that uh, while there's still time. And believe me, uh, there is uh, plenty, plenty of time left. Well, with that, we... I'm sorry, we have to close. Uh, we have a one more hour reservation here. And thank you uh, very much, every panelist. And thank you, the audience. And we uh, hope to talk to you individually after the conference. Thank you again.